The following podcast contains spoilers and words like G, whiz, and gosh damn it. We watch it. We watch it. Hello, everybody, and welcome back for your weekly dose of We Watched a Thing. You've got Billy, as always, and this week I'm once again joined by Nooski. How you doing, Noosk? I'm good. You shocked me with your enthusiasm. You gotta be enthusiastic. You have to come to the show with some gusto. Gusto? Yeah, gusto. Gusto. Nah, it's Spanish made as gusto. Um, okay. <laughs> First time back on the pod since Halloween. How have mm. you been? What? Don't ask me that. Why? I live with you. Yeah, I know, but the listeners don't. They don't care I how mean, I've been. You live in their hearts, sure. But how have you been? <laughs> Busy. Working. <laughs> We did have time to get to the movies, though, because our great friends at Dandy Cinemas Canberra are doing this awesome thing. In the lead up to the new Dune finally being released here in Oz, they're running a retrospective of Denis Villeneuve films, which is awesome. I think Denis Villeneuve is easily one of my top directors of recent times. You and I have seen quite a lot of his films over the years. Yeah, We've- I didn't know that. <laughs> I've just heard Denis Villeneuve, Denis Villeneuve, and I was like, what's a Denis Villeneuve? <laughs> but we both very much loved Prisoners, Sicario, Arrival, oh. um, lots of great films. And so finally, through this retrospective, we've got the chance to see a couple more. So this week, we're going to talk about 2013 Enemy. Yeah. So, Enemy is a 2013 surreal psychological mystery drama thriller film. A lot of genres there, Wikipedia. Directed by Denis Villeneuve and produced by M.A. Fora and Niv Fitchman. It's written by Javier Golon, loosely adapted from Jose Saramago's 2002 novel The Double. It stars Jake Gyllenhaal in a dual role, Melanie Laurent, Sarah Gaydon, Isabella Rossellini. And what is it about, Noosk? Have fun with this one. Isabella Rossellini. From friends in the list and many other things, I'm sure. <laughs> I, my my head goes straight to Merlin. <laughs> oh my god, Merlin! Yeah, <laughs> oh, she's she's always the one that got away to Ross to me. <laughs> one of them, not on your list. Anyway, sorry. What's it about? Um, Jake Gyllenhaal is a college professor. He spots someone who looks like him, and he's a bit weirded out by that, as you would be. And he tracks him down through perhaps very unorthodox methods. But, you know, maybe you would do that. I don't know. It's, it would be weird to find someone who looks exactly like you. Yeah. I mean, it is weird. It's happened to me on several occasions. Every time I go to a Kevin, Kevin Smith. Smith show, <laughs> I see a sea of people who look <laughs> identical to the Bee Dizzle. And Kevin Smith does look like you. It's basically <laughs> overweight dudes with goatees. Oh, my God. It's like looking in a mirror. <laughs> You don't have a goatee anymore. You have a Not beautiful, me. lush beard. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> so, let's get straight into it then. Hmm. Um, had you heard of this film? No. I didn't know it was a 2013 film. I, when you said that, I was like, oh. I had heard of it, but I did not realise that until halfway through when we started seeing spiders. And I was like, oh, this is the film. And so, it it's actually a shame because it ruined the ending for me because I knew that ending because i'd heard people oh, talk about it and what a you? kind of mind fuck it was oh yeah but it, but you still jumped like i did at the end i did it still surprised me even though i knew it was coming it mm. was still like whoa yeah <laughs> maybe because you didn't know that was going to be the end so it still surprised you when yeah. it happened mm. yeah so i had heard vaguely of this film but not a lot this film came out the same year as prisoners another Denis Villeneuve film starring Jake Gyllenhaal. Mm. Yeah, we liked that film. Yeah, and so I feel like maybe this film maybe got overshadowed a little bit by that, just being the same year, you know, same actor. Two really big stars, perhaps, as opposed to And also, let's not beat around the bush. This is a weird film. Like, this is a- Yeah. This is probably the strangest viewing experience I've had since- With Jake Gyllenhaal. (laughs) Since Killing of a Sacred Deer, perhaps. Oh, yeah. And it's very similar in tone to that, where it's it's not- Like, this is not a horror film at all. And, like, horror is not listed in the genre, but it's unsettling Mm. in a lot of ways, I think. Mm. Yeah. I I definitely- I really enjoyed it, but I did turn to you at the end and go, what the fuck? And yeah. then, yeah, it was it was through um, exploring on the interwebs that I was like, oh, I feel like I understand it better now. And, yeah, as you said, it's kind of a 
It's a, it's an intriguing film where you don't necessarily get it all on the first go unless you turn to the interwebs and then you're like, <laughs> oh, I see what they're but doing. But that to me is actually a huge plus of the film. You oh, know, like, yeah. There are plenty, I would want to watch it again. There are plenty of, you know, quotation mark, confusing films out there. That doesn't. That doesn't always make a good film. No. And what I really like about this film is that it challenges thought and it makes you think while you're watching it and after watching it. And look, did I understand all of it on my first watch? No, not at all. No, you were the same as me. Yeah. I think on a second viewing, I might have gotten more of it. Mm. Oh, look at me and Billy. <laughs> and I think, but I think that that's a really good thing about the film. And what I will say too is when you when you look up the film- and you dig a little bit more into, you know, what other people think and how, how people explain things. You never go, no, nah, that's fucked. <laughs> you know, no. like, that's not there. Well, like, I, no, we, re- we read good articles. Shout out to thisisbarry.com because, <laughs> man, he really, <laughs> he really explained it for us. And then you were like, oh, yeah, I would have gotten that the second time. And I was like, <laughs> fuck off. What an obnoxious thing to say. You don't know that for sure. But even without having gotten it, it doesn't take away anything from the enjoyment of this no. film, I think. What was that piece of shit film you made me come see with you after last year's lockdown? Tenet. Tenet. Fucking Tenet. Let's not bring up Tenet because Topher and I both gave it a low score and that led to our first string of one-star reviews for the podcast. <laughs> Fucking Nolan crybabies. Well, you don't do this for the people, you do it for yourself. <laughs> so, and I'm not I'm not here for anyone. <laughs> I'm just doing it for you. So, look, people, Tenet was shit. It was confusing and it was shit, But it wasn't confusing in a good way. I didn't immediately go, ooh, I want to watch that again and figure it out. It's intriguing. No, it was just shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's get straight <laughs> into the cast. Gyllenhaal. I'm 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 a long time Gyllenhaal fan. Yeah, he's always I good. think he's always great. And he does a very probably I think the best dual performance I've seen since Nicolas Cage in Adaptation. I think <laughs> I thought you were about to say in face off, but that's not <laughs> <Travolta. laughs> But this was a really strong performance from Gyllenhaal. Yeah. Oh I'm I i do not know. Like I thought it was strong, but I didn't expect any less either. He was good. You're you're not hating Gyllenhaal no. at the moment. Oh no. I'm not a Swifty. <laughs> I didn't understand any of that. <laughs> Remember the other day, I found a scarf in our bedroom, a woman's, clearly a woman's scarf, and I was yeah. like, are you cheating on me? <laughs> yeah, Knowing was- full well you weren't, but I was like, I found a woman's scarf. It's my sister's. <laughs> yes. And and you were like, no, I'm not Jake Gyllenhaal. And I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't get it. Okay, it turns out there's a whole thing with him and Taylor Swift and a scarf and some oh, bullshit true. that happened I 13 mean, years ago. 13 and years ago they dated for like through, two I don't know, months whatever. and now everybody hates him? Come on, people. <laughs> it's pretty He's funny. allowed to break up with her. Do, no, do, she, do no, you offe- know? no offense. She seems like she'd be hard work. <gasps> How dare you? <laughs> we know nothing about her, Billy. You can't say things like Mate, that. Mate, give me Carly Rae Jepsen any day. <laughs> <sighs> Carly Rae Jepsen is the queen of pop music. You know nothing about these women. And can I just say, you you did like Taylor Swift when she first came out too. You love a good female sung pop song. Shut I up. I do. I mean, no one will ever be Michelle Branch, but... That's true. That is true. <laughs> but look, no one owes you a relationship. And look, I, I hope people ragging on Jake Gyllenhaal is just all in sort of good fun. He doesn't seem too affected by it. <laughs> Sour Patch Kids got on his case. What? They tweeted about, like, oh, happy Monday to everyone except Jake Gyllenhaal. Like, <laughs> Jesus. Look, I mean, that's kind of funny. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I think that he is really, really good in this film. And, oh, yeah, yeah, the film, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is so easy to just get sucked in. And even this is what I love about it. Even when you don't 100% know what is going on, you never feel confused. Because the story mm. itself, even though there's a lot thematically happening, mm. the story itself is quite linear and straightforward. A guy finds someone who looks identical to him. Like yep. you said, he tracks him down. They they kind of get involved in this mm. kind of strange relationship. And it's it's very, very interesting and very easy to follow, yep. even though there's it's a lot going on. It's weird that it's so straightforward and yet completely unpredictable too. It yeah. was the first film I've watched in a long time where I couldn't guess what was happening next. And I was like, wow, that's 
what a breath of fresh air. Yeah. In in you know an age of fucking a million sequels and prequels and reboots. It, yeah, I don't know. It was really good. Uh, what I really liked about it was, um, let's face it. F- finding your identical twin double has been done many times in many films, sometimes comedy, sometimes drama. What was interesting about this was taking such a simple concept, but how disturbing it felt every step of the way. The tone yeah. the tone of the film was really cleverly done. It was good filmmaking. Yeah. <laughs> good but on you, Villeneuve, whatever. This, this is one of my favourite genres of, of psychological thriller is that real – internal kind of thing that starts with such a silly premise. I haven't made you watch it yet, but there's a French film I adore called yeah, La Moustache. La Moustache, I know. About yeah, this I'm guy who that. shaves off his moustache and everyone around him is like, what are you talking about? You never had a moustache. And that's the premise. That's the movie is just him being like, what the fuck are you talking about? Here's a photo of me with this moustache. And everyone's like, no, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and he goes fucking nuts. <laughs> Like and in the American office when they're like, does Stanley have a moustache and they're evenly divided? <laughs> and it is such a simple premise that could be so silly. Like, mm. this is the same. Like, you find someone that looks the same as you. And yet, the not just the writing, but the way that it is so deftly directed by Villeneuve and the atmosphere that is created at every step. Like you said, there's always something kind of unsettling about it. It's always, always treated in this really off-putting way like well there's always like a real sort of haziness to the film mm. i don't know much about toronto we didn't visit there when we were in the states and then went up to canada but i i i don't think of it as a very smoggy city like i think like it looked like, it looked LA. like la yeah, yeah. um but it was I don't know, there was just this haze over it the whole time, which was really kind of everything seemed dingy and gross and there was this sort of beige wash, even when you weren't looking at the city, over the film in general, um, which made, especially because he's kind of just like, I don't know, plodding through life, not really going anywhere, it kind of made everything just feel a bit blah. And I really liked that the first time him as a college professor met Helen was the only time there was like a real breath of fresh air in the film. Mm. The trees were moving. It was windy. The sun came out yeah. on them. It was the first time I felt like you actually saw sunshine landing on people in the film, even though you'd had seen a couple of things outside here and there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. It was just really interesting filmmaking yeah. and the music. Ah, uh, great score. Yeah, yeah, so unnerving. Yeah, I loved Sarah Gaten in this film as well, actually, as Helen. She was amazing, mm. I thought. She was just perfectly cast. She seems she- so pure. Um, they often dress her in, yeah, whites and, um, yeah. yeah, creams and stuff. She just seems like purity compared to at any other point, any other woman you've seen, you know, with the weird sex club at the start. And yeah, yeah. Mary's, you know, just a- I don't know, a businesswoman, I suppose. She's she's just a chick going to work, but she's often in black and yeah. I suppose she represents his temptations and affairs and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sarah Gaydon won Best Supporting Actress at the Canadian Screen Awards for this film. Mm. So, it was nominated for 10 awards at the Canadian Screen Awards and it won five. Mm. I'm not surprised. And it was named Best Canadian Film of the Year at the Toronto Film Critics Association Awards. Mm. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> It's so decent. You kind of just alluded to it a little bit just then when you said about, you know, Mary representing his temptations and everything mm. and the fact that by the end of the film you discover that this is just one person and mm. whether or not there's actually multiple if you, personalities. I don't know if you ever discovered seems- that. Well, that's what I was just going to ask you. D- you. Did you not read that by the end? I, I always just had lots of options in my head going. And one of them was that, yes, they are the same person. I was like, obviously something's gone wrong in the Matrix. It was interesting that the film um, very much tried to clear that up for you. We have the exact same scar. We ca- we're not brothers. We can't be brothers. But I don't know. They just felt so different. Mm. He played them like they were completely different people. And so you never truly lent into them being, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're seeing like a split personality type thing here. Yeah. And that's what I, I love about it is I don't think it's as clear cut as, you know, this isn't split, for example, no. glass, where, you know, I think it is more that kind of 
compartmentalizing sides of your mm. personality. We're which, seeing let's face, his subconscious. Yeah. yeah which, let's face it, we all do. You know, like we all have different facets to us and stuff. And mm. I think that's a really smart way to approach it. Yeah. There's podcasting Billy and then there's just <laughs> normal Billy. <laughs> I, Far less extravagant and outrageous. <laughs> I did by the end of the film finally pick up that okay i th- i feel like this is thematically supposed to be one and the same person hmm. i think there are enough clues towards the end but what i like about it is that you can also just read them as quite off-putting kind of strange things hmm. like when when he is with helen hmm. at the end and she says to him how was school today and yes. he's kind of like what hmm. like you could read that as just her accepting this affair and she knows this isn't her husband, but, you know, there's something just kind of- mm. She knows it's not him. She knows mm. it's not the one that, that had left her about and him. this one's better. Yeah. And then she says, I want you to stay. That bit really got to me. I was like, oh, I don't know. It just felt, yeah, I don't know. It just really got to me that bit. And then him- finding the key to the new sex club, wherever the location was or some crap. And he was like, instantly, oh, I'll see where this is going. And in at the time, you're like, well, of course you'd be curious because he doesn't know anything about the sex club. He's a different person, but he's not. Yeah. And by that point, you're already starting to clue into, well, they're not. They're, they're the same person. Yeah. And so then you're kind of let down by him. Giving into it again, giving into yeah. temptation, I suppose, as it represents. And then there's that fucking freaky ending <laughs> with yeah. the spider. Yeah, the way that spiders represent his fear of commitment in this film mm. and just kind of women in general yes. is very interesting. Yes. What I, I, I picked up sort of from the beginning because that tarantula, I don't know if it was supposed to be, but it- looked very pregnant, like the the camera angle was focusing on it from sort of behind the large abdomen, you know. Um, And, of course, the the giant spider walking through the city after he's seen his mother who he finds overbearing. And and then, of course, yeah, she represents the biggest spider in his life at the end. She's pregnant. She represents him having to actually get his shit together and be a decent person. What I would love, because I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Another man who, like, is frightened by commitment and mm. whatever. Like, I was a bit like, Meh. what would be interesting is to reverse this film and have it from a wo- woman's perspective. Mm, that would be interesting. Because I just, I don't know. Like, I really, really like this film, but when I sort of had fig- figured it all out by the end and through my interwebs <laughs> research, <laughs> I was like, huh, webs, see what I did there. Um, <laughs> I was a bit like, oh, okay, yeah. Well, that's what's most interesting to me about it is, uh, apart from fear of commitment and all that stuff, really, thematically, the film is about history repeating itself. Hmm. And we get that from the- Well, he says that. Well, yeah, he's a history teacher. The very opening scenes of the film after the sex club is is him giving the same lecture over mm. and over and over again. And it's it gets in- increasingly monotonous, mm. as does the sex that he's having. Mm. So, he's, he's talking over and over and over about history repeating itself. And we're seeing these flashes of Mary. And, and him and Mary don't converse at all. She comes into his apartment, mm. they have sex, and she leaves. And yep. it's- it feels monotonous and dull and- The ultimate point is that Mary and Helen deserve better. <laughs> <laughs> but really the point is that, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I read this film as that people- Don't change. Can't change. People mm. don't change. History will repeat itself no matter what you do, mm. you know. It's a and very it's, depressing it's thought when you look as, at fucking humanity. It's as simple God. as people's behaviour, but, you know, it, it's it's as large as- strangely the history of the world repeating Mm. itself in strange ways. Mm. And so let me ask you this. What do you think happens in the 10 minutes after this film? Does he ever settle down and look after his wife and child or Mm. does he- does he give in to temptation again? I suppose it's all in how you read his final expression. So we're all freaked out by the giant fucking spider that you weren't expecting when he but opens he's the not. door. He's, he's not. He's not. Yeah. He's well. He's at first. He's like at first mildly surprised. He's like, oh, and then he's like, ha, this old chestnut. Yeah. Hey, hey, love. 
<laughs> How yeah. you going, Pat? Yeah, I suppose it's what you take from that final expression before the credits roll. And maybe, I don't know, maybe I would come to a different conclusion on the second watch, but, and maybe I'm just trying to be an optimist because I was disappointed when he was choosing to go back to that temptation, you know, life, whatever. But I hope that by not being frightened of her, um, that he is ready to commit, but if he's seeing her he's as still a giant seeing- spider, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't seem likely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's a bit like, oh, you. Anyway, <laughs> I'm off to the sex club. <laughs> Have fun being six months pregnant. <laughs> I love, I love that she knew he wasn't the same guy who left when he said, do you need anything? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If your husband says, do you need anything, and you're six months pregnant, and you're like, what's up? What's wrong with you? Maybe you're not with the right person. Yeah. Come on, Helen, do better. (laughs) Kick his ass to the curb. (laughs) For me, the one knock I do have on the film, and it's not a huge knock, like, I still think that this is an incredibly written and put together film. Mm, I really like it. I think that it perhaps goes a little too far with some of the red herrings. Like, for example, the climax of the film, when Anthony is full raging mode. Yes. When he has- the When he has gone with Mary and then, you know, he's- And she knows it's not him. Yeah. Yeah, like, you're not- You've never had a ring mark there and- Yeah. And he's- Cranky, because he's not getting his way. Yes. He can't fool her into sleeping with him. Yeah. And and then he crashes the car mm. and they die, which mm. in hindsight, obviously, is symbolic of that side of Adam dying. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that kind of womanizing, cheating, dickhead side mm. of his personality Probably. dying, right? Then they turn on the radio- and they're hearing news about this car crash, which yes. obviously is not a real car crash. And it's not even clear whether Mary is a real person or not, or if, if she's just another representation from his subconscious. Yeah. That why, really why threw are we hearing you. about a car crash on yes. the radio that didn't actually happen? Like, Well, that threw I, you walking out. You were like, but we heard the car crash on the radio, so they must have been separate people. So don't pretend, Billy, like you were like, <laughs> yes, I knew, I knew by the end they were one person. And I, I just think that for me, it goes just a step too far with the red herrings to try and make, like, I I get it. I get that this is a very, it's a theme heavy film, really. Like this, you know, it works on multiple levels. And I guess it is nice to be able to take it in on that level as being a surface level story. Hmm. But yeah, I just, I think it could be slightly cleared up just with a few very minor changes. Look, and I'm probably being a dick here. Villeneuve probably doesn't want it cleared up. He probably wants it to be a little bit muddy. Yeah, I think that's the point. Yeah. Like, yep. if, if, if multiple people have to write articles on what they think were going on after your film, but yeah. but in a, in a way that they're intrigued and, and want to figure it out, not because yeah. they're like, what the fuck was that? That's a good thing. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk about the look of the film and the production design. Like you said, it's a very murky look at Toronto. Mm. Like, it's very- it's a it's an ugly film, mm. which really works in its favour, I, I think. I always think of Toronto as, like, a beautiful city, but maybe that's just my public perception of Canada. I don't know. It's probably one of those things, too. But places are different when you live there. Mm. You know, like, I don't know I what- I suppose any city can have smog, really. That's, you know- That's life in a most, city. Yeah, most people probably wouldn't think of- Like, overseas people think of Sydney as being a smog city, but Sydney's fucking gross. Yeah. Yeah. Sydney sucks. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> likes Sydney. <laughs> but I, I love the look of this film. And I think the the visual effects work on those spiders is gorgeous. That final shot where she is a spider in the bedroom is just, it's And she's haunting. in defense mode. She's scared, but she's in defense mode. Yeah. Like she kind of reacts to the, the door being opened. And I suppose him saying, I'm off to my sex club. Yeah. Yeah. It's like- we both jumped, then you see his expression, and then it cuts to credits, and we were like, oh, what the fuck? Well, that's the thing. And you brought up the excellent score earlier by Daniel Bensey and Sonda Jurians, which is a 
a great score and mm. it's so atmospheric and Unnerving. really just yeah and yet those final moments complete silence when mm. he opens the key and he sees it and you see his face and he's like yeah i'm going to explore this and he mm. just he very calmly says oh do you have plans for tonight because i think i'm busy and it's like come on mate you just fucking changed yeah and yeah. there's nothing she doesn't respond there's no score it's complete silence mm. he walks in that room the only sound is the sound of her kind of cowering yeah, like, uh, it's hard I know. to Does explain the make sound, a sound like that, but it's it like, just <laughs> it's just the sound of her body moving. Yeah, and, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and it is just fucking great. And then you just smash to credits. Such mm. a, a strong way to end this film. Yeah, it was really clever. And what I loved reading later with you was like. You know, um, oh, the the smash of the car in the car crash was actually like a web pattern, and you were like, I noticed that. And I was like, sure you did, buddy. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> and then- Look, I might be a wanker, but I'm not a liar. <laughs> you are a wanker. And then there was the part where, um, you know, he was looking at photos of himself after he had seen the actor that looks like him, sort of, which would be very unnerving. Um, and he was, I suppose, looking at photos of himself to establish that, yes, in fact, he does look like that. I don't know. <laughs> but- well, that's what we thought at the time. And he pulls out the torn photo. Yeah. And then later, the photo is in the apartment, which, mm. yeah, you didn't quite realise. And the, and the woman from the torn pieces is Helen. And so, that, of course, is a really big fucking clue that they are, in fact, one and the same person. But, yeah, yeah it, there's so many little things like that that just we had each noticed that you would put together as a whole when you watch a film a second, the film a second time. Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing that I really appreciated, which I wasn't expecting to, this is not the kind of film that you would think of as having to be seen on a big screen. And yet I think that the cinema was the perfect hmm. experience for this because it's kind of inescapable. You're kind of stuck there in the Well, that's what I need. I need a film like this where you don't get respite. You can't take a break. I need that in horror. I fucking hate horror films, as we've established. You need a psychological thriller to give you that sensory deprivation from the rest mm. of the world to yeah. really- I mean, I feel like this film would pull you in anyway, but um, it is a quiet film. There's whole scenes of just, you know, not a lot of talking and stuff. So, it would be very easy to lose track of what's happening and miss things if you, yeah, were watching it at home and- yeah. You know, you were checking your phone. <laughs> yeah. So, we've now seen all of Denis Villeneuve's films for the last 10 years, with the exception of Blade Runner 2049, which we're getting to next week at mm. the Dendi Festival. Mm -hmm. How does this compare to the rest of his filmography for you? Sicario, Arrival, Prisoners. Yeah. Hated Sicario. That's insane. No, no. Me. I- No. Don't talk over the top of me, Billy. <laughs> I hated That's it. That's insane. <laughs> Don't st stop it. Don't talk over the top of me. I hated it because it was such a well-made film and I f I honestly just found it really scary to be yeah. honest. Yeah. yeah, it freaked me out. It was just a bit too gritty and I I would like to watch Sicario again. I I thought I was going into a pretty light um drug cartel film. I mean they're never light. But I was going to say a light <laughs> drug cartel film. No. What are you looking for? No, <laughs> a sense of adventure. No, <laughs> no, no, no. You you know what I mean? Sometimes there's more of a thriller element to yeah, them, yeah, okay, whereas yeah. with that it was very- Straight drama. Straight drama and very dark. And they're yeah. just like kind of really just disturbing. Like there was lots of disturbing images and yeah, I was just like, whoa, God, like it was a good film, but- I, it freaked me out. So, that probably goes bottom of the list until I can rewatch it. I really loved Arrival. I really loved it. I, I love when people can do an alien film that's not all fucking Independence Day or- yeah. What was that one that started out so well and turned to complete shit? District 9? Yep. Yep. I really loved that- You and I are on a bit of an island there. That film is so beloved and I don't Fucking get it. Fucking sucks. Yeah. Here we go. More people leaving in droves. <laughs> Hang on, do You're I, never going to have me on again. Do, do I need to make a noosk big call? Sting? <laughs> don't you dare. Don't. I hate that thing. Um, no, that film sucks. It was so good to begin with because it approached the aliens in a different way. They were refugees, yeah. blah, blah, blah. 
then it just turned into mindless killing, as alien films so often do. And yeah. that just, it pisses me off, the <laughs> arrogance of humanity to just assume that, I don't know, ma- mm, maybe so- more people are leaving droves now. It's a real American approach to aliens. Anyway, Denis Villeneuve is obviously Canadian and approached aliens very differently, <laughs> and I appreciated that. I was like, good on you, buddy. So, do you have any expectations going into Blade Runner 2049, knowing uh, that I it's- suppose I would expect some psychological elements to the film. Yeah. Um, knowing that it's a sci-fi that's a sequel to an older film. I haven't seen the original one. It's an interesting- Is that going to be a problem? Nah, it'll be fine. It's an interesting move from Villeneuve. And then obviously now he's gone right into Dune, which is taking a, a yeah, very I'm I'm not beloved- that with you. Very beloved book series that has never really translated well to film. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. What do you mean never really translated well? It's been adapted several times to both film and miniseries and oh, all are renownedly <laughs> terrible. Yeah, look, I'll I'll leave that for you and Topher to discuss. I know he's very keen to discuss it with you. Even when he was leaving, he was like, but I'll be back for Dune. <laughs> Having seen the ad constantly every fucking time you're at a cinema- It just, I don't know. It's got a great cast. All right. That doesn't mean anything. How are you scoring Enemy? Really liked it. Eight out of ten. I'm a nine out of ten. I love this film. And I think that it is, I mean, my guess is that it would be very rewatchable. You know, Mm, this is one of my favourite kind of films. And I said the same thing about Black Klansman a couple of years ago. There is nothing better than a movie that can make you think and still be hugely entertaining at the same time, Mm, which is what I found about this film. I was drawn in completely to this world that it was creating. And regardless of whether or not you can fully understand it at the time, it's insanely watchable. Yeah. I love thrillers and I really like psychological thrillers. They're, I think, my favourite genre of film. Would you, because I immediately was like, oh, my God, I have so many people to tell, go, you know, go watch this film to. Would you recommend it to everyone? To everyone? Yeah. No. No. I would recommend it to all the listeners of We Watched a Thing because I know that you people are exceptionally smart and, and appreciate fine art because you're listening to this. Do you not have so- enough Patreon money already? <laughs> like, what's what's the problem? <laughs> but but would I, I – like, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it to everybody. An arachnophobic person. <laughs> <laughs> Just like y- your general person on I the would. street. I would. You would. Yeah, because I would want to talk about it with them afterwards. That's the best part about this film, discussing it after. Yeah, okay. And figuring it all out. Nice. Yeah. Well, so thank, go, you, thank you go, for joining me. Go watch Enemy People. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do want to discuss it, hit us up. We're around. <laughs> around <laughs> uh next week this thursday i'll be joined by the beautiful stacy hurley talking about the wizard of oz and next thursday i'll be joined by tofa talking about dune and before then he's we'll less be- beautiful before then we'll be back <laughs> talking blade runner 2049 so stay tuned for the next couple of weeks are we people. talking about blade runner yeah you and me yeah. oh oh cute <laughs> what, what did you think this was I don't know. I see films with you. I don't know what your Thanks plan is. Thanks to our great friends at Denny listen. running the Denis Villeneuve <laughs> retrospective. Yes. It's awesome. In the meantime, if you want to get in touch with us, you can do that at wewatchedathing.com or wewatchedathing at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all under the handle at wewatchedathing. If you want to help support the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wewatchedathing, and I'll catch you next week. Go watch Enemy. <laughs> <laughs>